drifting over the muddy banks of my heart. Oh, love. So for me personally, uh, pretty entrenched in this one vein of Christianity, as you and I have discussed, and then came into conflict with actual tragic moments in my life where the belief system that we all held didn't have room for the things that were happening to us as a community. Mm. And that's really the, th I, I had actual real life situations that happened to me where, um, that caused me to just to ask all kinds of questions about the nature of a being and the nature of my relating to God. There was a there was a family in our church, and uh, the husband in the family was murdered in the middle of the night in his bed. He was sleeping in his bed. Okay, oh. so we were we were a, we were a church that was in the middle of I would say like we were in a season of renewal. So we were we were experiencing actual physical healings in our church where people with terminal cancer were being prayed for and being and they were recovering you know uh, I'm talking about times of refreshing like uh, the Apostle Peter talks to to these people uh, in the book of Acts where he says they're saying what do what should we do to be saved and he says hey repent so that times of refreshing can come upon you like that's what we were experiencing I mean people were walking into the presence of God and giving their lives to the Lord yeah. We were experiencing this on a week in and week out basis. We weren't some decrepit little church where nothing was going on, right? So right smack dab in the middle of this, a really bad thing happens, okay? Has come to nothing under a bloody avalanche. And I hear my say, I'm so excited today to have my first guest of 2019 on the program. Andy Squires is a songwriter and a pastor in Charlotte, North Carolina, whose 2015 album, Cherry Blossoms, was hailed by many as one of the most refreshingly honest and lyrically compelling albums of the year. You know, Christian songwriters over the last 20 years have often fallen prey to writing songs that simply provide acceptable platitudes about faith. But Andy's music captures the real depth of an authentic faith journey, uh, filled with vulnerable lament, hope in the face of suffering, and the genuine joy of wrestling with God. To those who are disenfranchised with their Christian faith, or to those who are just honestly seeking for a map to navigate their life, or even to those who are weary and road-worn on their journey with God, Andy's songs in wisdom are a healing balm. In this conversation, I talk with Andy about what happens when our particular experiences within our unique stream of the Christian faith brush up against experiences that don't fit what we've believed. How losing a friend in an act of senseless murder while his church was experiencing revival affected his journey of faith. And we'll talk together about why expressing our anger and hurt with God is sometimes the perfect prayer to pray. So I hope you enjoy today's conversation with my good friend Andy Squires. Raise a glass for me when the blackberries grow. So wishing for what is not so Cause we found out when nobody should know Well friends, I'm really excited to have my pal Andy Squires on today's episode. Andy joins us from Charlotte, North Carolina. Are you in Charlotte proper? Is that correct or are you... You guys yeah. just moved recently to get closer, huh? Yeah. Yep, that's right. So yeah, I'm I'm right smack dab in the heart of the city. I mean, why 
why move closer instead of further away from the city? Isn't we, that what people are supposed to do? Yeah, we moved. We lived in the suburbs for 20 years and uh, joined our current church about three years ago. And we just we knew that if we were really going to um, walk with this community, that we needed to be in proximity to it. You know, mm-hmm. so that's um, that's why we did it. Um, you know, city living has its upsides and its downsides just like anything else it's a, it's it's significantly more expensive but um we just felt like it was worth it so yeah. we've been down here for going on six months now and it's it's been a great a great move for us so mm. well i invited andy you know heading into 2019 there was some people I wanted to have discussions with and one of the primary purposes of this podcast is to is to help people that are wrestling with God and whether that means they've come from perhaps like a similar background as me and grew up in evangelical circles and have now hit their adult years and perhaps are experiencing cognitive dissonance or maybe the answers they got as a kid about certain things were just now they're, they're maybe finding them inadequate. And um, so over the course of like the last couple of years, I've spent more and more time just sitting across the table with, you know, a lot of times, I mean, it's been particularly young men that are in their 20s, uh, heading into like their adult years. And they're coming with real questions, like really wrestling. Um, it's not cynicism. It's like, a healthy wrestling with God trying to sort through. And there's also people I've connected with the last few years that are, you know, maybe didn't grow up with that background and they are, you know, the, the term church circles over the years has been seekers, right? They're, they're, they're honest seekers. And one of the things like I experienced is I try to tell them, well, you know, maybe go check out this book or something was, mm-hmm. you know, a lot of the stuff I was reading is really like academic and it was just handing them a book that was super academic was like, or an article was not something that I felt was incredibly wise or useful yeah. to them. And so I started scrolling through looking for podcasts to yeah. refer to people. And I found there's a lot of stuff out there that's helping people be honest about the questions. Mm-hmm. But my experience, um, and this is, you know, those things serve a a particular purpose, but in my experience, a lot of these were really focused on the deconstruction and were deconstructing people's faith so much that they they felt like they had to leave Christianity and enter into something else that arguably isn't Christianity anymore. So when I started thinking about people to have to hopefully like facilitate the kinds of conversations that would help people that are in that spot do like the yeah. healthy deconstruction, but also yeah. to reconstruct in a positive path. You yeah. were one of the first guys I thought of. Mm-hmm. So, um, Andy is a songwriter. He's a pastor. He's a dad of a bazillion kids. It seems like how many kids you got again? Six. We've got six. Six. Yeah. And, um, I think we perhaps got first connected through overlapping circles. You know, I, I've been a songwriter. I've been in ministry for 15 years. And a lot of that has been in charismatic context. That's like my background. And I know we had some overlapping circles. And honestly, I think the first is I was trying to recall back the first beyond just like a a follow on social media or something that I had an interaction with you is that you had asked me if I would listen to this song that you wrote and you sent me an email of it. And it was this song called cherry blossoms. And it was like a rough mix of it. And I was like, man, yeah. it's really cool. This guy is cares enough about my opinion. And the, I, I, you know, I plugged in my headphones, you sent me an MP3 and an email and I cried yeah. the first time mm. I heard the song. Uh, yeah. You seem to be pretty good at producing that effect in people. My so, bread and butter. <laughs> yeah, it's your bread and butter. So, you know, maybe there's some people that are tuning in that, I, man, everybody I talk to, I go, man, you got to check out this guy's 
songwriting and his music. But maybe for those of you that, uh, for those people that are listening in that have either no grid for who you are, they've got no set of experiences, or for those that maybe have heard your music but don't really know much about your faith journey, could you tell everybody a little bit about your story? I know we occupied these overlapping circles and charismatic circles right like, had that always been the case did you grow up in the church what what's a little bit of your your faith story so my parents were saved in the jesus movement my my mom and my stepdad i should say uh they were saved in uh what was historically known as the jesus movement in the late 70s and uh so through that experience they came into the church and uh my earliest memories are this um there's there's a denomination called Foursquare, which is the church that we ended up landing in. And uh, I mean, I was there for this little tiny church in Santa Cruz, California. I was a part of for, you know, all of my um, young life and into early adulthood. And we were uh, um, theologically uh, evangelical, charismatic. And um, so uh, very prominent emphasis on worship and uh, the the gifts as described by the Apostle Paul in the New Testament. And uh, that what would, would that what would that look like? I mean, you know, I know there's some people that connect that maybe come from, you know, cessationist backgrounds, meaning like they they didn't grow up in church contexts where. Yeah the gifts is a, f- a phrase they're familiar with. Right. Can you give some sort of like description of what that might look like on a, s- a Sunday morning? What was normal for you? Well, in the early eighties, it looked a lot different than what things look like now. And, uh, so, so you could be a Pentecostal or a charismatic church. And, and the, the main thing that would, uh, differentiate you from the Baptist church down the street was that you had drums on the stage, you know, like that <laughs> yeah. was, that was a, the, it's hard to imagine this, but there was a time then that, when that was not normal to totally have not. rock and roll band on your stage. Right. Right. That, that was an idea that was new at some point. And it was really the charismatics that ushered that in, you know, putting drums on the stage. And, um, so, so we had, we had, uh, as early as, I don't know, 78, 79, we had, a full band presentation on a Sunday morning. And then, uh, and then we had lots of music. So it was, you know, it wasn't like a a solid song set. Like you see nowadays, it was like eight or nine or 10 songs that just flowed together. There wasn't stop start or anything like that. It was just like one song after another, you know, so for a total of like how much time, like well, how much time would you spend in singing on a Sunday morning? 45 minutes. Yeah. Or yeah. Even, you know, and nobody noticed it wasn't <clears throat> like <clears throat> people yeah. weren't keeping track of the time, you know? And then, and then on the more, more actual charismatic side of things, uh, there were, we would call it, singing in the spirit or spontaneous singing. So we would, at the end of a song, we would just, people would just sing like whatever words that they wanted to sing, calling out, you know, calling out to the Lord and, you know, and with the commodification of worship music nowadays, there's tons of videos of like people standing in auditoriums and everybody raising their hands and singing out and like, it, it's it's become normal, but yeah. there was a point where that would make you the redheaded stepchild in the in the body of Christ. If totally, if your church was doing any kind of spontaneous singing, oh, it was it, so weird. Within this subculture of church, that was very weird. And then to add more weirdness on top of the worship set, where there would be no singing, there would just be waiting, like there would be silence and waiting. Yeah, and, and not the, like in a liturgical sort no, of we're, not in we're, liturgical. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There would be a lull. And that was the time when we would be waiting to hear from God. So, when, and we would be serious about this, that there would be uh, prophetic words given. Mm-hmm. So somebody would stand up and either give a word, and it would generally start with, thus saith the thus Lord. Thus the Lord, yeah. <laughs> uh, they would end with, thus saith the Lord. You know? Was it in King James, too? 
it, it just depended, it depended on who was giving yeah, the word. Right. Right. And then, then there were also tongues and interpretations. So somebody would stand up and they would give a tongue, and then somebody else in the congregation would give a uh, an interpretation to that tongue. So mm. I honestly I don't see that anymore. Even in even in charismatic circles, I have I it's probably been twenty years since I've seen an actual tongues and interpretation in a charismatic church, even or or churches that claim to be yeah yeah charismatic uh or pentecostal so it's that's it's it's probably just the circles that i'm in now i'm sure it happens still but yeah um, it's a rare thing in my view anyways so as a kid i mean this is in your childhood or teenage years into like early adulthood early adulthood is this as you're experiencing this expression of church does it feel normal to you or at some point even as a kid did you feel any sort of like cognitive dissonance with those sorts of expressions or just was it fun never it it wasn't fun it was just what it was like i i don't uh i don't remember feeling strange about it the only way i would feel strange about it is i would think especially as a teenager if only my friends at school knew what i did (laughs) on sunday morning that would be weird right but when i was in it and experiencing it myself it wasn't anything um i mean it was just the water that I swam in. So Mm -hmm. it was just, it was, I I, I wasn't ambivalent. I just wasn't necessarily weirded out by it, you know? Yeah. So yeah, that's what I cut my teeth in. And then, and then, um, you know, around 94, I was newly married and I was leading worship in that church. It's where I learned how to play guitar and to sing in front of people and lead worship. And, so <clears throat> around that time is when the renewal wave hit the church, you know, so things like Brownsville Revival, the Toronto mm-hmm. Blessing was happening. Yeah. And so my church was very interested in those things. So that all of that stuff came into my view. And, you know, it's funny of- because uh, we, we share this background. And so that naming those locations, mm-hmm. uh, I instantly identify with, but I, I don't think your average evangelical Joe or evangelical Sally that grew up in, you know, the Baptist church down the road or, you know, know, an evangelical Presbyterian church. I mean, they probably have never heard of Toronto or Brownsville, but they were so important for our circles that I also occupied too, as a kid growing up. Yeah. So, so where I'm at now, I'm in, I'm in my middle age and I'm, I'm walking with guys that are in their mid twenties and our worship community here at Queen City Church. And one of my main jobs now is storytelling because I'm, I'm, I'm catching people up with, uh, just with the story of God in, in our tribe, at least, because there's virtually no connection to it for people that were born, you know, in, if you were born in 98, 99, there's probably not much that you would, uh, you yeah, know, no. be able to connect with on that level. So, so I, I tell a lot of stories for these guys, just, just for the sake of like, Hey guys, cause sometimes I'm talking about my value system. And a lot of these guys were grew up playing guitar in churches where, uh, it was about the songs or it was about the presentation. It was about the program. Right. My core value system is, is more when it comes to worship has more to do with actual experience. So I'll use words like, Hey, we're going to go after the glory on this. And they'll look at (laughs) what is that? Which direction do I turn to get to the glory? (laughs) (laughs) So when I say that word, I really just mean like getting past all of the, fakeness and getting into a place of vulnerability, you know, mm. anyways. Yeah. So those are my beginnings. And did you stay in that like stream, if you will? I mean, that's a, that's a word I think I'll just probably stick with. I don't know. I don't, we haven't talked about this before. I don't think, but I don't know if you've read Richard Foster's stream is of living water. Are you familiar yeah. with that work? Got it. I have it in my bookshelf right now. Okay. Yeah. So we'll use streams as yeah. maybe a, a better word than mm-hmm. denominations or did you stay in that sort of stream where showing up on Sunday, like you're expecting 
God to do something that maybe looks like what you're reading about in the New Testament. And yes. at any point, were there things that happened in you? I mean, now you're not only attending, but right now you're in your early adult years. you got a guitar in your hand, which, again, people that are in just general, more broader evangelical context, like the one I'm in now, which is in an E-free evangelical free denomination, yeah. you know, they don't get that, like, in those contexts, uh, not, this is not a slight against any pastor that ministers in those, like a lead pastor, a teaching pastor, yeah. but, but worship is the main course, right? I mean, right. and so you've got this responsibility, you're leading, you're essentially pastoring already when you just have a guitar in your hand, you don't maybe know any better. What was good about that experience? And what have, what were maybe some things for you that you felt like, I just can't, I can't find all of my identity in the stream. I need to maybe get exposed to other things outside of this stream. Yeah. So I've never left this tribe or this stream and I I'm still a part of it. I'm still leading it. Uh, and, and I've, and I attribute so much of who I am to this particular way of knowing God. Mm. And, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, so my wife and I were a part of a church in, in Charlotte. Uh, we moved to Char uh, Charlotte, North Carolina in 99, and we, we, we joined this church, this um, little, little church just north of Charlotte, actually, and it was so formative for us. We, <clears throat> we, uh, it was kind of maybe the next phase of expression for the church in general, like the church I grew up in, maybe more Pentecostal leanings, maybe maybe a, a greater commitment to a quote holiness. So right, like right. no dancing or drinking allowed, right? Like just just unless you're a, dancing in church. Yeah, yeah. In a worship dancing yeah. church praise. Right? So just in a nutshell, that's just yeah. a real broad stroke there. But moving into the next phase of being a part of a church where uh, a little more grace oriented, uh, definitely still charismatic in practice. And always with this this grounding uh, expectation uh, of of meeting with God in whatever time we were meeting, you know that was it was like man, I, I have such a rich heritage from that particular church because uh, I what I learned there is the corporate pursuing of of the Holy Spirit, um, not not just as an individual, but as a uh, community wow. of believers embodying together uh, worship. Well, you know, I want to say this. One of the things that Charismatics and Pentecostals get right is that they that um, they embody their worship. So mm -hmm. they, they put themselves into it. And yeah. I understand that emotionalism can get involved there, but emotions are important. And, yes, your, yeah. and your body is important. Your emotions and your body are a big part of who you are as a person. So, so um, I, that ha, that taught me to appreciate spaces that allow a person to be demonstrative, uh, even to the point of making the people around them uncomfortable. You know, there there's degrees of that that. Um, a freedom that really just foster uh, a robustness in a community where that's allowed. So I yeah. want to say that that yeah. the positive side of my life in that version. Totally of me, right. It, it makes room for it makes room for allows for the sanctification of emotions. Right. Yes. Whereas um, in some other contexts where emotional response is discouraged because it's for some reason seen as counter right. to, um, I, I, I still haven't figured out what it's really counter to, you know, I guess, yeah. you know, people perhaps just want to have a, a rational, we're going to exegete a text, you know, we're going to exegete the scriptures and yeah. then we're going to have a, you know, I, I don't know, some sort of, uh, mental ascent will give mental ascent to yeah. some concepts and then hopefully those concepts we play out in our lives. But I, I'm in full agreement. I'm so thankful, like for my own experiences, which 
I am not like a very demonstrative physically person, even back in, right. you know, the heydays of uh, being in my charismatic circles, you know, I'm, I was never much a dancer, but I remember as a high schooler going to a Pentecostal church yeah. and the freedom I actually experienced when I'd go visit this Pentecostal church and it was a dancing church and it was just a one, two Holy ghost hop. Sure. You know, you're just looking like a polo, polo stick, but it did something to yeah. sanctify my emotions in that area where I maybe didn't feel like I could ha- experience joy with God. Um, so I, I just want to affirm like that. And that's even in the like, context where I'm at now, which are a little bit broader evangelically, yeah. you know, there's a hunger there that I've heard from people that go, we want to be free. We don't want to feel this sense of uh, constriction on these emotions that we regularly let out in all other sorts of contexts, right. whether it's a an NFL game or a party with your birthday party with your kids, you have all these emotional responses yeah. that you allow out. And then yeah. suddenly we enter into this church context and it's like, those are no longer appropriate. So anyways, I just inter- interject that I, I've seen that as really significant too. Is there any way that is there a dark underside to that at all? Like, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say dark, but I, I think that everybody, uh, their, their strength ends up becoming their weakness. This is true for everybody. So, so in, in, uh, more, uh, maybe more reform circles, they, they elevate the mind, they elevate the rational mind. And, and it's the, the, Fruit that comes from that is so good because they, I mean, they have a broad capacity for understanding the scriptures, right? Yeah. Um, but the downside is, is that they're not making room for the other parts of their human humanness, humanity. Yeah. yeah. And and then I would say in our in our circles in my in my stream, um, they were just they're, they're, I'm I'm being funny here, but it's like they were just suspicious of anybody that would read a book, you know? Totally. Like, <laughs> Sem- seminaries or cemeteries, right? That's what I heard growing up. It's that kind of language was used, yeah. a lot, you know, like holding at arm's length people with MDivs and PhDs and philosophy yeah, totally. and theology, right? Why was like, that? Why was that? And you, and like from your perspective, what was it about that skepticism towards people who would, you know, engage with the scriptures or God using reason and their intellect. What, I mean, why was that seen as a hindrance? Well, one of the, one of the, um, kind of, uh, how do you say it? One of the, one of the strongest values of our stream was that, uh, we, well, well, I think a lot of folks, how do I put this? Many times, we are all living in reaction to something else. Yes, yeah. It's a truth so, to be juxtaposed to another untruth that you're yes. trying to. Yeah. So a lot of a lot of the charismatic Pentecostal church was born out of a reaction to a very dry and uh, just a dry version of Christianity, right? Mm-hmm. So, so even now, I. And I know we're going to get to this point in our conversation, but even now, this this deconstruction of evangelicalism or this push into liturgy as opposed to uh, what we see in most evangelical churches in terms of their worship, that is a reaction to yes. the last 20 or 30 years of, in my view— the commodification of worship. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, it, it's not necessarily coming from a robust understanding of church history. It's just reacting to the last 20 years. Yeah, I totally agree. Which is a necessary adjustment, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. but, um, sometimes the pendulum swings too far. You get in the other ditch, the right? Thing, right. Like, exactly. And that's, to me, why we're having this conversation, because right. you and I are both observing this, especially with, with the internet now, we're, we're observing people that are, it's not that they're re- having a reaction to it, their wound is bad, it's, it's just, their reaction isn't, uh, it, it needs to be better formed, 
or informed maybe informed so. i think is the right word you know i think one of the things i was so surprised by in my seminary journey was the openness to difference of opinion i, I don't know i know not everybody has that experience at, yeah. in their seminary journey but uh, i'm really thankful the seminary i attended fostered i mean to the point where i was and it, it was an evangelical seminary. There were instances where professors pushed me to think about things. I go, boy, that's, I was go, I was concerned going in that it was going to be so maybe too conservative, right? Sure. sure. And what I experienced was challenging ideas that made me go, boy, I, I didn't, I don't even, is that actually within the Christian tradition? But one of the things I so appreciated about it was that everybody would have uh, people in my cohort uh, interactions you have with your professors. And even as you would read like journal articles and then reviews of journal articles, there was just this exchange of ideas that didn't seem like it was so deeply attached to one's identity yeah. that they were afraid to ask a question that might cause them to re-examine something. Yeah. And I just, I was so, in my experience, there's this been this huge disconnect between that sort of attitude in we might say theological academia yeah. and that which happens in local church contexts, right. Right. um, where perhaps the notion is that it, it maybe is more tribalistic, right? I have to defend my particular stream. I'm, I'm trying to find this unbroken chain all the way back to the apostles and to Christ yeah. in which I can say, I am in the unbroken chain right. and others that have different ideas. But I think one of the things like Richard Foster highlights is that I think if we look at the life of Christ, we can see maybe some of these emphases, right? So in like charismatic context, the emphases on the kingdom of God being here now, right? right? As like a reaction to those that were saying, well, the kingdom is to come. Yeah. So you're going to have to wait for um, the eschaton, or you're going to have to wait till you die to get healed from something or to get set free from something. Yeah. But then we look at the life of Jesus and in and, and and Acts, right? We see the kingdom activity bringing that, that future yeah. consummation of all things into the now. Yeah. And then we actually see in the life of Christ, right? We see, um, you know, we see obviously like Jesus had given himself as a boy at some point to the scriptures, right? We see him at age 12, like, yeah, you know, in the temple, like unpacking the scriptures with right. the biblical scholars of that day. Yeah. And then we also see him have these, which I think in most evangelical contexts are difficult passages. These passages where it seems like Jesus even at times connects our very salvation to how we care for the poor. Absolutely. And then you get, you get like the social justice crowd. That's like, yeah. yes, that's right. it. Um, and what, what I hear you saying is that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but like people perhaps that have had just one of those particular streams and they've maybe had an overindulgence of a message that maybe yeah. t went too far. And now it doesn't look like Jesus yeah. anymore. Yeah. Right. It yeah. looked like one thing that Jesus emphasized or he walked in divorced from these other facets. And maybe there's been along with that, some abusive stuff and people go, well, this one stream I've been told my whole life is Christianity. Right. Right. And so now I have experienced cognitive dissonance, pain, or this doesn't make sense. And because this is the only thing I know of as Christian, I'm going to have to find something else outside of the Christian narrative. I, I don't know. Do you think that's fair to say? Do you think that's yes, part of what's I, happening? And I, so I, I think that's part of what's happening. But it, sometimes we talk like there's this massive exodus out of our, these particular religious streams. And I, and I think there are many people that are leaving and, and going through phases of deconstruction. But I also think that there are many people who will never step foot out of their initial thoughts or the yeah. initial thought that they were given. And the reason is, is because it is so disconcerting to have your, 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 your theological imagination challenged, threatened, you know, I was talking with a friend recently 
his parents are in their late fifties, have given their entire lives uh, to preaching the gospel, ministering to the poor, and and he shows up with kind of some. Uh, he read. He's like he's like so many other of, uh, others of us. He read a Richard Rohr book, right, or <laughs> something of that nature. Yeah. So he's he's thinking differently about. Well, his hermeneutic has shifted a little bit. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> And so he was telling me about his engagement with his folks. These are good, godly, sincere, Jesus-following people. And he was saying to me how he he was telling them about this different view. And he was they, they the conversation never got ugly, but they were just very uh they were perplexed. They were like, well. Basically, what you're saying, if what you're saying is true, then everything we've given our lives to over the last 40 years is undone. And as yeah, he's telling and that threatens, us, that threatens one's sense of existence and being, right? Absolutely. And I, and I said, and, and he was wise enough to know that uh, that, that was okay. Like, he, he didn't push into them further than, he wasn't trying to undo them. He just realized that, oh my gosh, when you actually try to wrap your brain around a new idea, and maybe you get it a little bit, but when you try to discuss that with somebody else who's never even known there was a question to ask, yeah, you throw them and you you bring them into a place that they're just not ready for, you know. Mm-hmm. So, uh, I guess my point with that is, I I personally am trusting in a work of the, of the spirit. I I believe there's a, there's a work of the spirit that is leading us to places that he wants us to go, you know? And so, so for me personally, uh, pretty entrenched in this one vein of Christianity, as you and I have discussed, and then came into conflict with actual tragic moments in my life where the belief system that we all held didn't have room for the things that were happening to us as a community. Mm. And that's really the, I I had actual real life situations that happened to me where, um, that caused me to just to ask all kinds of questions about the nature of of being and the nature of my relating to God. And, uh, so he, so here's what I mean. Yeah, could you share one? Perhaps? Yes. So, yeah. so the yeah. big thing in my life, and a lot of people have heard this story before, and this is what the cherry blossoms album was based on, but there was a, there was a family in our church and uh, the husband in the family was murdered in the middle of the night in his bed. He was sleeping in his bed. Okay. Oh. So we were we were a we were a church that was in the middle of I would say like we were in a season of renewal. So we were we were experiencing actual physical healings in our church where people with terminal cancer were being prayed for and being and they were recovering. You know, uh, I'm talking about times of refreshing. Like uh, the Apostle Peter talks to to these people. Uh, in the book of Acts, where he says, they're saying, what do, what should we do to be saved? And he says, hey, repent so that the times of refreshing can come upon you. Like, that's what we were experiencing. I mean, people were walking into the presence of God and giving their lives to the Lord. Yeah. We, we were experiencing this on a week in and week out basis. We weren't some decrepit little church where nothing was going on, right? So right smack dab in the middle of this, a really bad thing happens, okay? Now, that was hard just because that's just a hard thing to walk through. But philosophically, it was hard for me because we had these underlying background programs working in our minds. And, and I've talked about this before publicly, but I'll just say it again for the sake of this conversation. We, in the charismatic world, we had some, some of this kind of word of faith theology rattling around mm-hmm. that went like this. The word was powerful, and it was more powerful if you confessed it out loud. Yes. Right, because right. if you confessed it out loud, those realities would manifest in your life. Mm. So one one of our practices would be to 
confess or to quote Psalm 103 or Psalm 91. And these are, these are psalms of deliverance and protection. They had to do with things of disease not coming near your household. Yeah. Yeah, the or, positive confessions, right? Or 10,000 falling on your right. Yep. But no, nothing's coming near you, right? Mm. So, <clears throat> um, so when something like that happens out of nowhere, it just takes all of your framework and you just, you just have to examine it again. <laughs> Everything is up for examining when you're in a point of uh, just, I can only describe as utter weakness, you know? Or the alternative is to not look at it at all, right? I mean, you, you could also just pull your head under the covers and say, or put your, you know, your fingers in your ears, go la, 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 la. I don't hear anything. I don't see anything, right? I mean, those seem like when you have those sorts of experiences and I, you know, I've had similar ones. I, you know, by the time my church got into the nineties, my childhood church growing up, we were full on word of faith church and yeah. things like it, we didn't have, I don't, I can't think of any instances where anybody was murdered, but people yeah. dying of cancer that we had yeah. prayed over. Right. Yeah. And all of that. Oh, and you accident. brush up against it <laughs> and there seemed to be two, re- maybe three responses, right? One is like, I'm going to come face to face with this thing and wrestle with God yeah. Two, I'm not going to do that. Um, and I'm going to just plug my ears, pull the covers over my head or three, like I'm just checking out altogether, man. Like I don't even want to deal with this. Paul, so- I have, I have this working theory that people who believe in miracles or believe in the supernatural and believe in, in the miraculous, they have it so bad, man. I, I just like, <laughs> we, we are as charismatic people, um, setting ourselves up for a continual life of disappointment. And, and I, I, um, Mm. there's something so, uh, when I, when I talk to my Calvinist friends or my, my cessationist friends, um, there's something so comforting in a belief system where everything happens for a reason or, or where God is in control or where, um, you know, God and his sovereignty is making all of these things work together some way. So you really don't have to think about it. You just need to like, it's a, you just, you're able to just submit to the process, right? Yes. It, it's Whereas like charismatics have this theology about affecting and probably where the danger comes in. Right. And I've, talked about this before is where it moves from i can affect these outcomes to i can control these outcomes right right? that's the big difference there yeah so i i i just went through this process after that where i realized this i i think i think prior to this event I put way more trust in the way I actually believed or practiced my faith as being salvific than I do did after that mm. tragedy in my life. Because, because prior to that, I put a lot of stock into what I believed, how I worshipped, um, I mean, there was, there was some personal pride there for us, like self-righteousness, huh? Yeah. Well, I think, I think we Pentecostals were really like, Hey, we're renewal people, man. We're in the, we're in the river. We're, 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 we're full gospel. We're full gospel. <laughs> we're spirit filled. Yeah. 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 The other church down the road's got 50% or 60. <laughs> we, we got a hundred percent of the gospel. <laughs> so I honestly, I did yeah. react out of all that. And I, yeah. I kind of walked away from a lot of that um, hubris that we were walking in as a church. You know, we we didn't know we were walking in that. I mean, it wasn't like, yeah. Well, who does, right? <laughs> yeah, when you're in pride. You don't know it. I mean, yeah. that's why kind of these kinds of events are a little. They're kind of a gift because they they lead you out of your self righteousness and into grace. So, yeah. So you didn't leave though. I mean, why, 
you didn't leave the church. You didn't, I mean, for many people, uh, an event like that would begin a series of unraveling events, right? Yes. Um, and in many cases, like, I want to say this properly. Um, it's almost justifiable, right? I, I, and I think of instances, I think of particular, I mean, that one is like a, boy, it seems like the suffering algorithm just hit somebody and it doesn't make sense. And, but then there's also incidences where people have gone through sexual abuse in a church, right? Yeah. Physical abuse, a mental, emotional abuse, like really repressive damaging and even oftentimes illegal stuff. I I've seen this firsthand. I'm, I'm yeah. sure in many years of you being in church and working and being in ministry, you've seen sadly seen similar things. And it's almost like I, I can understand why you want to go. Yeah. Right? Yes. Why haven't you left the church? Why? I mean, you're still, I mean, you're a songwriter, but you're a pastor in a local yes. church. Yes. I don't, I don't see you guys on TV. I haven't uh, picked up any of your church's worship albums and any of the magazine subscriptions that always flood my mailbox here right. at the church. Yeah. Why you? Why did you continue on? Yeah. Um, why not leave? Like. It, so here's here's what I did receive from my church experience that I'll, I'll for the rest of eternity I'll be forever grateful for, is I had. I had actual fathers and mothers in my church that I trusted. And and when I looked out into the landscape of Twitter and you know the internet in general, I saw a lot of people who who had legitimate wounds but who were reacting in anger and not only not only actively dissolving their own faith but welcoming others into their own faith you yeah. know disintegrations yeah and i and i realized that a lot of those people were doing that one cuz it's a good c- career move unbelief sells books like you wouldn't believe like there's wow. a lot of people making a lot of money on deconstruction and unbelief deconstruction's okay but i don't really i don't have make much room for unbelief i i don't want what's the I difference don't, i don't want to live in that world where well to me deconstruction is uh it's like it's the shaking of uh is maybe it's the shaking of your dogma or your dogmatics you know like whatever whatever, I don't know, whatever form you have, it, deconstruction to me is just like, it's, it's challenging your form. Yeah. But it's, it's the destruction of something that you're hoping is in the process an idol and isn't a true picture of God. It's not a true picture of reality. Right. Right. You, you don't necessarily know that while yeah. you're in it. But I mean, you've gone through, I mean, you had to, in a certain sense, deconstruct or tear down certain pictures of God or even yeah. of yourself in yeah. that one incident alone. And that's just one, I mean, obviously a massive incident in the life of you and your church at that point. But yeah. I know that hasn't been the only one where you've brushed up against like, that's right. is my picture of reality match reality as it is? So to your point, I can clearly say this. 10 years ago, there are things that I actually believed that I no longer believe. Yeah. Anymore, right. Yeah. yeah. Um, but why I have stayed is because first of all, I've recognized that I don't have to have the same belief as the people that I'm living with. Mm-hmm. I, I, I can, I, I'm, I'm walking shoulder to shoulder with people who will never consider the things that I've considered in my thought life, you know, yeah. philosophically speaking. I need those people in my life just as much as they need me. So there, there are people that are maybe politically conservative and, and entrenched in evangel- evangelicalism, 
And I'm not either of those things, but I love those people because I've received so much from them. Just, I don't know, living life with those people in my church, you know? And so, so I was fathered by faithful, faithful followers of Jesus, fathered and mothered. And I want to be that for the, especially the younger people that I'm walking with right now. Because as loud as the most popular religion guy on Twitter is, that guy still doesn't know the young men and women in my church. He, he right. might get them to buy their books, but I know those guys and they know me. And that's why I've stayed because, first of all, I love Jesus. I've always loved Jesus. I'm, I'm, I'm passionate about him. I want to follow him. And I haven't always wanted to follow him, but I really do want to follow him because he's worth following. And that's the thing that I want to give away. I want to follow the young men and women that we have at Queen City Church. Um, so that's why I stay, you know. Yeah. Um, and and I think the Holy Spirit has really helped us stay away from uh, digging in on any. Oh, I I want to be so careful how I say this this because I because I really do believe it is important what you believe and how you believe is so important you know, um, but maybe like were describing earlier when you were talking about your university experience where uh, there was a atmosphere that had been cultivated where uh, divergent views could be yeah. held in the same room and everybody yeah. still drink a bottle of wine together like yeah. that's what we're doing here you yeah. know that's so no more like ideological teams right like it's not a I was listening to another podcast on the uh, on the way over to my office here this morning and they were talking about so many young people's experience or in general people's experience or association with the word theology is they instantly picture an arena where ideas are doing battle together. And so they right. think that they have to, the primary posture of like doing theology, which is simply like wrestling with trying to understand God yeah. is a posture in which I am defending my existence <laughs> up against someone else that I'm in this gladiators arena with. And if you yeah. can change that perspective and somehow get, and there's some like personal formation stuff and people need to go through counseling to get healed from a lot of this stuff yeah. where their, their identities are so entrenched in a particular idea. And a lot of times, yeah. especially in today's day and age and like you know, people like Charles Taylor and Leslie Newbegin and, you know, James K. Yeah. Smith have highlighted this, that in a secular age in particular, like we're all swimming in the, the secular soup, even though we might have these pockets in our church that yeah. we don't hold to that worldview. But in the soup that we're swimming in, it, the removal of um, in the secular vacuum, what ends up rising up in the religious place is politics. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's why people talk. I mean, it seems like you can't have any conversation today that people aren't right. instantly looking to identify you in political team A, political team B. And that right. even happens with talking about God. Right. And so you're saying that you're sticking with the church because you think the church could be a place and should be a place. And in its best version is a place where you've got a person like Simon the Zealot, right? Yeah. That can sit mm -hmm. across the dinner table from Matthew the tax collector, and somehow yeah. they're both wrong in the company of Jesus, right? Come on. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you this. I feel like the conversation isn't so much about... Uh, <laughs> the church heading into a high model versus a low church model. You know, I, I think there's yeah, been yeah. some talk about, you know, yeah. heading off into liturgy and all of that stuff. But 
to me, the biggest battle and the future of the church really lies in the extraction out of materialism and consumerism mm. and, and, and the addiction to influence. So mm. somewhere, somewhere along the lines in evangelical circles, the number one cause became getting people saved. And, and they, they put all of their money, all of their eggs in that basket, and they traded their prophetic witness to creating as much influence as they can to get Ask Jesus into your heart message to the masses. And so now we've, we, we've woken up in 2019 and we have a, a church that is your, your average, especially, you know, mega church is your easy target, but it's, it's like this idea of like, you've got a, you've got a great personality standing behind the pulpit. You've got the best musicians in the world playing the best music on these stages. You've got lighting and you've got 10,000 seats available to fill. And, and to me, there's so many problems that come along with that. What, what, what my hope is, is that the church gets smaller, it's irrelevant, it becomes irrelevant, it becomes decrepit, it becomes um, not so full of its own pride and vanity and it just begins to relinquish all of the the trappings and the commodification of things that were once holy and sacred uh, for the sake of of like of surrender, like surrendering mm. to the work of the spirit. I don't know if I'm making any sense right now, huh. but yeah, I just have this I, I just seeing this well well. How many how many times have you heard of some megachurch pastor falling into some kind of unhealthy lifestyle and it yeah. totally derails their their entire lives? Well, the reason it's not because that guy is just an idiot. It's because no, and it's happening at smaller churches too. Yeah. Yeah. It's because that model actually produces produces that in a man. So any any time you have a church situation where one man is the hub or like the center of that entire subculture's world, who can endure that? Nobody yeah. can endure that. And so I'm just, I'm, I'm looking, I want to be a part of a, of a church that is low to the ground, is walking in humility, is open to the spirit and is also open to a consensus of leadership filled with men and women, and and everything doesn't rise and fall on this one yeah. holy man of God who has all of the answers. Yeah, because none of us do, do we? No, no. I mean, I think I think that's one of the reasons why we're we're really thankful for the church that we've landed in right now, which is in a the government governmental structure of the church is congregational. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, it. It took me, it took them about three months to bring me on staff yep. because it had to go through yeah. <laughs> this process by which the congregation had a voice and it wasn't just me meeting with, you know, senior pastor, CEO right. and having, you know, a couple conversations. He's like, this is the guy. Now the church had to right. say that too. I think there's some healthy, healthy stuff in there. I, I think what I hear you saying though, is that maybe what we've fallen prey to is ultimately pragmatism that yes. the ends, the ends justify the means. And so we have this idea that the ultimate telos of following Jesus is to get, you know, get people into the pearly white gates right. and whatever, whatever means, not whatever, but many sorts of means yeah. that could get us to that point seems like it's good because it's getting justified by the end, which is why wow, we got, we got somebody here in the church and people that perhaps have grown up with that as normal. I think, I mean, you're a little older than I am, but, um, I said maybe pre-internet church, 
Yeah. Right? Like the days, yeah. the days in which, uh, you, you couldn't have heard about a Brownsville or a Toronto and not that those places, I'm not highlighting those as like places we should go and be like, Hey, yeah. let's, let's copy that. But I'm just saying as a cultural example, something was happening where tens of thousands of people were coming to these places and you had a pretty good chance of not hearing about it because the internet wasn't there. That's right. And so now in the days of the internet, people have grown up where maybe the commodification of worship, the commodification of church's big business is normal. And now they're really frustrated because something in that experience hasn't satisfied their deepest longings. And why, why shouldn't they just go, you know, the, Let's go elsewhere. I'm not even just saying, I'm not saying go elsewhere to a different church, but I'm saying right. it, why not just leave this thing all together and see what else is out there? Well, that, that is happening, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I, I know so many people that have done that. Uh, I, I don't personally do that because uh, I love, I love my life in the church. I, I, I just appreciate it. It's, it's been, it's been so life-giving to my family. It's life-giving to my children. And, and I really hope it's going to be life-giving to my grandchildren. One of the things that I've recognized though, is that Amy and I, have fought very hard for the things that we believe in. So we've, we've always landed in tribes where, uh, I, I'm a bit of a challenger. It's, it's in my nature to challenge status quo. And for the most part, I've walked in or walked with communities that have appreciated that, Mm. And so I do feel a bit of a call to the church as well. You know, I actually feel, hey, you know, it sounds a little arrogant to talk about destiny or, or whatever, but I can't fully walk away from that idea that there is, there is a calling on my life to do something. Yeah. And, and part of that means that I stick with the body of Christ even even when it's really hard in the same way I stick with my marriage, you know, it's not always, it's not always pretty or beautiful. And there's definitely times when you wound one another, but you, you let you, you play the long game. And and that's, that's what it really means to me to be a follower of Jesus is that you're playing the long game. And, um, and I, and I also, I want to be an old man who's not jaded and cynical, even though I, ha- I have a lot of reasons to be, I want to grow old and I want to become more inclined towards the things of the spirit, more inclined towards the body of Christ, more inclined towards belief than unbelief, more inclined towards joy than despair. And, and I want to, I want to say this too, that uh, what, one of your questions on the, um, interview pre-interview part that you gave me, you were, you were wanting to talk about laments and I, yeah, I, I, was just, I don't I was know. just about to go. <laughs> well, I don't know if we'll fully be able to get through that today, but yeah, I, I, I want to say that, um, uh, one of the things that I've appreciated about the charismatic church in particular, the one that I grew up in or was a part of for so long was, that in our experience, we learned how to corporately lament. We learned how to be sad corporately. Um, we learned how to process our unbelief prop, you know, corporately. Uh, hmm. But but I want to be careful when I talk about lamentation versus joy, because um, it's really not about having the guts to talk about sad things or to write sad songs. It's, that's not, that's not the dichotomy that you want to live in where you really want the sweet spot that you want to live in is you want to be in a place where you can freely talk and write about what's true. And so sometimes what's true is sadness. 
sometimes what's true is you just get up every day and you go to work and things just feel mundane. Sometimes what's true is that there's a move of the Holy Spirit in your church and there's ecstatic joy happening every service or whatever, you know? Yes. I, I, I want the thrust of my life to be about proclaiming what is true because that's where Jesus is. You know, I've always thought, had this thought about Jesus never, he never negotiated with, with liars. He never negotiated with Pharisees. He was always confronting people with what was actually true. And that's why we all flip out when the truth shows up in our lives in one way or another, (laughs) because we have our illusion and we're very happy in that illusion. And then reality comes in and reality is, excuse my crassness, but it's a bitch. You know, it's like, I, I, I rarely know what to do with reality because most of my life I practice living in a non-reality mm. and, and following Jesus really means owning whatever reality is and then, and then pursuing him within that reality. Yeah. So then based on, based on this definition that you're outlining of just being someone that speaks the truth, sings the truth in all of the shades and colors that the truth, um, that the picture of truth comes in, it seems like you do have a particular gifting to help people say the things like there's a, maybe a lot of, um, music of faith out there that helps people say things true about God, um, say things true about what he might want to have happen in the earth. Yeah. Say things true about his heart for people, et cetera, et cetera. Um, there seems to be from my perspective, a a vacancy that, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I get a sense that part of your calling is to help people say what's true in their suffering yeah. And in that brushing up, uh, brushing up against reality where it doesn't make sense. And that's what I mean by lament yeah. that lamenting the, even David had these, right. These cursing Psalms where yeah. he's like, I want you to kill my enemies. Yeah. Right. I want you to take them out. And there was something true. Not that what he was saying was in alignment with the truth that is, you know, Christ, but what he was yeah. saying was a true reflection of his experience of reality. You know, Ellie Wiesel in the, the town behind the wall, this, this quote, um, I read it a few years ago and it just blew me away. I go up against him. I shake my fist. I froth with rage, but it's still a way of telling him he's there. Yeah. That he exists, that he'll never, uh, that he's never the same twice. That denial itself is an offering to his grandeur. The yeah. shout becomes a prayer in spite of me. How do you feel? Is this just something that's in your DNA? Or do you work hard to cultivate language that helps people properly shake their fist at God, froth with rage even, yeah. and have it remain worship? Yeah. Uh, what so what's the question exactly the question is like this seems like there's something in you and in your wiring yeah, yeah. where you help people do that yeah you know okay. when, when the cherry blossoms album came yeah. out i remember sitting in uh, my office at a different church at the time and it gave me the ability to say some things that i really wanted to say to god but i just had been holding back right, right. um you right. know there's uh you know, your song, what, what nobody should know. Yeah. And, uh, you've got another one that's, I I imagine is coming on your new record about, uh, is it you bring the morning, right? And I bring my grieving. Yeah. I bring my weeping. Yeah. Um, is that something that you have always just felt and like an ability to do? Is that something you've had to cultivate and why do you think there's not more room for those sorts of songs for that area of the truth to be yeah. also expressed in song? Well, because, well, first of all, 
songs like that don't sell. Like, so if you're, if you're in it for the money, you're just asking for a, a life filled with heartbreak. Cause you'll never get money out of that kind of t- talking, like talking about God like that doesn't sell books. It doesn't sell CDs. It doesn't, it doesn't get you, uh, on the big tours. It, it gets you the Woody Guthrie life of like riding the rails with your crappy acoustic guitar and playing little house shows for 12 people who have ears to hear what you're saying. Right. So that's, that's one of the reasons why that doesn't happen, you know, but, um, but I, I feel, I feel called to it because I feel, I feel the most myself when I live in that space of saying what I really, what I actually want to say. And I do have a, um, part of who I, I am is I have a high value for words. I'm more of a wordsmith than I am like an actual guitar player. That's yeah. to me, the guitar helps me do the lyrical part of what I do. And, um, uh, I just think that I've just gotten to a place in my life where I was like, Oh man, to hell with this. The, when I try to write songs that would be acceptable at your average American church, first of all, I don't believe anything I'm saying. And secondly, when I play those songs, nobody cares about them. Like I might, I might get, yeah, you yeah. know, a bunch of people to sing my song, but does it really matter in the, in the, Scope it's like you're, you're answering questions that people don't really have questions about. You know, the phrase, God is good. Uh, that, that one phrase threw me on a, a, a 15 year theological journey. <laughs> Cause I kept hearing people say that God is good. God is good. And I didn't know what that meant. I mean, I, I always knew God was just, but yeah. God's good. I mean, so when I hear preachers or somebody sing that in a song, God is good. I, I don't want to hear that in a song because I don't know what that means. Mm. I, I, sh- show me, show me what that means. Work that out for me. I can't sing platitudes. I don't want to preach platitudes. I don't want to. I don't want to talk in platitudes. Um, and and I realize a great portion of the world will always deal in platitudes. And so I'm just the fly in everybody's anointment, ointment. But but nevertheless, I have to remain true to that. I mean, I was in a I was in a hospital waiting room this week with people that there there was a family member dying, and people were literally saying things like, "Well, God's got this." God's in control. I mean, they, they were just like trading platitudes back and forth. And, and I had to stop myself. I was like, oh, don't judge these people. Yeah, yeah. That is absolutely true for them. Mm-hmm. Like, I, I don't have time or energy and they don't have capacity for no. me to actually walk through what, that, what they're saying with them. So what I do is I go back home into my closet and I write songs about that or I, I write an essay about that. I wow. work. I work that out. What a my, practice. And then and then I try to set it to a melody somehow. And I'm committed to only eight people hearing that song and caring about it. <laughs> because because truly, truly, I I I kind of have figured this out that if you're going to if you're gonna be an actual artist and not you know there's there's different viable ways of making music some people do it they do it really well they make a living at it to one degree or another and i think that's a perfectly acceptable way of thinking about your life i don't think about my life that way in terms of my music i'm really sold out to doing what i want to do artistically speaking which includes saying what i want to say philosophically speaking mm. And, and I'm really okay with the number of people who will be into that being a small number because I think that has a greater lasting value than if I just sat down and think, what would be a good corporate worship song to write today? 
Yeah. Yeah. And and I highly and I highly value good corporate worship songs. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have a particular yeah. calling yeah. that you don't need to, you know, you don't need to trade your slingshot in for Saul's armor. Right. That's a great way of saying it. You just mentioned, and maybe this would be the last thing that we can kind of close off on. You just gave everybody a really great spiritual practice that you do to wrestle with God. I mean, you shared this example of you being in a hospital and and it's a difficult time. People are trying to make sense of reality. They're trying to make sense of God. And maybe in that moment, all they have to cling to, right, is the thing that they've been told. And yet inside of you, you're going, well, that phrase alone is, (laughs) is not, that's not working. And yet you gave this practice that works in your life of you going home in your closet and you like Jacob, yeah. go to war and wrestle with yeah. God. And you're able to turn that into song. A couple things. I, I want to get just to maybe as a pastor, when other people come to you and they're dealing with various experiences that cause that sort of dissonance that you experience, where you go, I don't feel like I'm being honest with God in this moment, but I got to be somewhere for yeah. my own health of my heart to make sure that I'm actually in a, in a vibrant communing relationship with God and not just some idea about him. Yeah. I think I'd love to hear when people sit down with you as a pastor, moving, taking off the songwriter hat Ah. as a pastor, and they're coming to you with like, how do I wrestle with God? What other sorts of practices would you say, you know, but for somebody listening here and they're dealing with, whether it's just like, you know, a theological question or whether they're brushing up against suffering square in the face and maybe they're not a songwriter. Yeah. Do you have any pastoral wisdom for those people as to, Hey, here's a way that you may want to try this, try this to wrestle with God. Uh, That's putting you on the spot, but that's that's, I love that question. So there's different categories, but for people who are in deep suffering, I try not to talk much at all. I try to just listen, and and then when they're done talking, depending on where they're at in in their in their stages of grief, a lot of times I just welcome those people into their grief rather than giving them a pathway out of their grief, because mm. most folks feel ashamed and guilty. I, I should say yeah. Christian people feel ashamed and guilty for for being grief, you know, being in grief, you know. Seems like a like you're you're for some reason it seems like you're doubting. Yeah, you're being God. Yeah. yeah. If you if you're experiencing sadness and yeah. So I welcome people into that and, and I try to just create a space and say, hey, listen, there's gonna be a lot of thoughts floating through your brain right now about who God is, just let them come. Don't, don't, don't try to suppress those thoughts. We can process those, but you just have to give yourself time. I mean, yeah, so time is important. Um, for folks that are, are struggling theologically, um, I, I, I guess it just depends on the, the nature of their struggle, but one of the things that I try to uncover is where their, where you know the origin of their struggle. So I've got I've got one friend of mine. He plays guitar at our church here, and he was raised in a Baptist church. And he, I, nothing against the Baptists, but I feel like this guy's whole young adult life has just been a uh, exercising the Baptist version of faith that he was giving given as a young child. And that could be just particular to his local congregation too. Right. You know? Yes. Yes. And it's it's that experience combined with his his actual personality who he is as a person. It wasn't just like all of this bad right. stuff was done to him or it's something. It's never just nature or nurture. Right. <laughs> yeah. Right. And so, um, so 
typical of somebody from his generation. He's listening to all the standard podcasts that you and I know, like the liturgists and things of that nature. And those guys are great, but, uh, but I know one to send him to send him to. <laughs> yeah. Right. So, so, you know, so walking through, I, here's what I try to do. I try to keep belief and faith at the forefront of my conversation with people like that. I mean, some people will try to threaten me. They'll, they'll say, well, Andy, I, I'm considering atheism and I never fall for that. I, I always just say, well, go for it. Try that out. Give it a shot. You know, um, because when I do the math on that path, I, I feel like I can see the end result of that. I don't like the, I don't like the outcomes of that. And so, um, I just try to talk, talk real with people. I mean, yeah. to answer your initial question, I mean, there's not really a silver bullet in any one situation, no. right? No. But constantly trying to create space for people to. What's fascinating is how when you give people permission to to express what they're actually thinking, how much of their problems go away just through that one practice, mm. just working it out out loud in a safe space mm. does wonders for the human soul. Mm. Well, thanks, Andy. I think those are, I mean, you're right. There isn't a, a magic bullet for all these instances, but a consistent thread I'm hearing is, um, one, if you're like in a pastoral or some sort of mentoring role, I mean, it sounds like you're a non-anxious presence for yeah. people. Yeah. You know, and perhaps maybe because you've, you've gone deep enough into the abyss yeah. where you go, it's not that bad. No. <laughs> <laughs> right? Yeah. Yeah. And it, you know, I think one of the concerns you've expressed and I've, I've shared as well as for people that do that detached from community yes. and they're simply, um, you know, doing the self-help spirituality. Yes. You don't have anybody telling you like, well, pump the brakes for a minute, man. We've, we've, yes. you know, over the years of teaching, right. So many young people that I've been able to sit down with, I think one of the things they're instantly shocked by is when they brush up against a question that someone else in the church's 2000 years history has actually had that same question. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, maybe they're shocked by that and they're shocked that within the Christian community can be a place to not be all right. Yeah. And so, I mean, I just, I'm so thankful because even in my own life, you're, you're someone that I go, Boy, if I was really wrestling with somebody, we're not like super close. I think we've hang, hung out in person maybe once before, but we wow. talked on the phone and ex yeah. you know had internet exchanges over the years. I know you're the kind of person I go, man, if I really came face to face with something that I'm like, I want to throw in the towel, yeah. I could say that to you. Totally. And uh, some pastoral encouragement I'd give to anybody listening to this, whether you're listening like in a role as a pastor or leader for others. And everybody has probably someone else in their life that that looks to them. At least I, I hope that's the case. Yeah. The rec the words the words of advice that Andy has given just to simply let people say what's on their minds. Let them, if we're in agreement with Ellie Wiesel, let them pray. Yeah, they're, this is a prayer. Yeah, you know they're letting out the deep things that are in their heart, and we know just from from science and psychology, when that doesn't happen, uh, it bleeds into other areas of our life and sometimes comes out in toxic ways. So I'm really thankful for that, that bit of advice. And, uh, thank, thank you, Andy, for taking the time to have this conversation. I think it's going to be immensely fruitful for people listening. Um, and, uh, you know, if, if any of you guys is, you know, fine, if I throw out your Twitter handle, I mean, that's not necessarily yeah. meaningful community, but I, uh, I appreciate uh, you know whatever insights you offer there. And you're in the middle of, this isn't just a sell record here, but you are in the middle of making something that, and you're doing it because you think it's going to be valuable. And I think it's going to be valuable. So I think it's worth sharing. Yeah. Can you just tell people that are listening, you're in the middle of a, of a second, I mean, you've had other albums, but yeah. would you well, really consider this your second yeah, that's a good major way. project? In this, in this strain of, of 
of life for me. This will be my second project. This is the follow-up to Cherry Blossoms. And I I like this next batch of songs because they're they're super dark and they're super hopeful at the exact same time. And uh, I'm just just excited to see what this record does for people especially people that are connected to this conversation that we're having now i do believe that there is a to, to use this uh religious um <laughs> phrase there is a remnant there is a remnant of people out there that are are really clamoring for uh, a reality that we're talking about and i think that you know Paul, I'm just so thankful for you. I mean, I don't want this to sound like a mutual admiration society or anything. <laughs> but I'll take it. <laughs> but like guys that are talking like this and leading these conversations, I'm just so thankful for you. And, um, you know, I can think of two times where I've called you with a, <laughs> where I was stuck in a theological conundrum and just being able to process that with you has been so helpful. So I think this record, this next record is going to, it's going to represent that for some people. So yeah, it should be out in the middle of this year sometime. So yeah, I can't wait. And I know, you know, I would not be surprised if this isn't like a prophetic word or anything, but I, I wouldn't be surprised if you found in this guy, this one, this next child that you're birthing here, that uh, it, it, it might go wide as well as going deep. Maybe. Because I think what you're saying is when God raises up a remnant, there is this moment where um, the hunger for a new idea, a new conversation, a new experience reaches its tipping point. And when there's not a lot of people offering that conversation, right? Uh, I'm just believing that they will come to yeah. you. And I think you've got the, the enough internal health to be able to handle that so man i hope it blows up i hope it reaches deep and wide and um if not you know you will at least go really really deep with people that need it so blessings on it man i appreciate it thank you all so much Thanks for listening to today's episode of Deep Talks, exploring theology and meaning making. I want to invite you to subscribe on the podcast platform of your choice, whether that's via Apple Podcasts, or Google Podcasts, or on Podbean, or even on uh, YouTube, where uh, we hope to add this year more video content. If this is your first time listening, uh, I encourage you to go back, check out some of the other podcasts I've done. Uh, last year where we've explored some of the tough questions that people really wrestle with when it comes to God, scripture, theology, understanding the world, making sense of our experiences. This certainly isn't going to be the only conversation that I have or guest I have this year. There's going to be more throughout the rest of 2019. So thanks for subscribing, listening, leaving a review. And as always, I welcome your feedback and your engagement, have conversations together. So Send me a message, uh, leave a rating, leave a comment on the uh, platform that allows you to do that. And I look forward to continuing the journey together. Till next time.